we determine the European call option numerically here. In particular, using Monte Carlo. This just means that we make multiple simulations. So we model the share with a trend term and a noise term. And so we see that if we simulate that many hundred times, what do we end up as? What would the call option be worth? in each of those cases. There is though the issue of risk neutral pricing, though we only touch on it. By that I mean that when you price using Monte Carlo, we take the trend term as being the risk free rate, which is not obvious. I mean, if say you're trying to work out what the call option is, and you're talking about a share which is growing at 20% a year for the last two or three years, then we're pricing that the same as if you we were talking about a share which was growing at 2% or even declining. So why are we allowed to do that? That's a deeper question which will create content for further on down the line. But here, we're just going to use Monte Carlo and show that we get the same answer as we do, as we get when we do it analytically. So we saw that we could evaluate the price of a call option using Black Shoals in the first video, where the result that we got matched with a known correct answer, where we know that if we set the five parameters to these values, that the answer is equal to this from Hull. So here we want to now evaluate the call option using Monte Carlo. In Monte Carlo, what we do is we simulate the share price many, many times. So we go, okay, the share price starts at 42, and then we know how it evolves. We know that there's a drift term which is equal to 0 0.1, and we'll go into that. And there's a noise term like the Wiener process where sigma is equal to 0 0.2. We price the option in a risk neutral world. So what that means is that we set the trend term, the growth, to be 0 0.1, which is the risk free interest rate. So, you know, you could be going, wait, the share I'm talking about is a high growth stock. Surely I should use mu based on what the value of mu is for that share, historically. It turns out that you don't. <laughs> you basically use, uh, you use the theorems of financial maths which tell you that in a complete market you want to use risk neutral pricing because that will give you the correct answer. Essentially, if you were to use the trend growth rate of your share, that should equate to a higher risk level. And that higher risk level should mean that you will be charged a higher interest rate if the thing you're trading with is being traded in a market, that should be happening. Otherwise, there's arbitrage. So since we're using the risk-free interest rate to price things, 
as opposed to a risk adjusted interest rate we have to use or we're allowed to use mu is equal to r also if you use that you get the correct answer if you don't want to go into it in greater depth that is a big step in itself which we'll cover in a later video so what's done here well this is standard Excel we just define we write a function to see that you just press alt F11 and here's our function so in short what it does is it breaks the time we're talking about into n steps so you know if you're simulating for one year I could have say n is equal to 100 and we move in increments of a hundredth of a year that's one of the parameters we have in the function otherwise we take as arguments the various parameters associated with the black shows model so the initial the current share price the strike price the risk-free interest rate and sigma as well as the time so then this is your standard programming so here we have a loop where we simulate one iteration so in the J loop we're breaking the time that we're talking about so I'll imagine say one year we'll break that into n steps and each in each one we increment here's the share price s1 is equal to s1 plus s1 star mu so that'd be the trend growth star delta t plus s1 star sigma so that would be the Wiener process term where you have multiplied by the square root of delta t and if you're familiar with Wiener you would know that you have a square root of delta term and if you go up here we see square root of delta is equal to the square root of delta the reason I do that is so that I own you know I work out what the square root of delta is once at the beginning instead of doing it every time again and again so that'll mean that I won't do as much computation I'm not wasting CPU time in this we see we actually have s1 and s2 I'll go into the reason why we do that in the next video but basically you know we're incrementing the share price so say it began at s so it we're setting s1 is equal to s0 the initial price and then we're incrementing it by the standard log normal process where there's you know a trend of mu and a Wiener noise term then after we've in, in, after we've simulated you know one time period so say one year or 0 0.5 in this specific, specific example then we end up with a, a particular value of the share price what that share is equal to after that year or whatever now since we're have a strike price of k I have s1 is s1 minus k and if s1 is less than zero so if the share price is below the strike price well then s1 is equal to zero because in this final part uh, s1 is equal to the value of the option not great for code clarity but it does the job if the share price is higher than the strike price then s1 is s1 times well it's discounted at the risk-free interest rate so in that one iteration we get oh the share price was equal to this and if, if the share price is equal to s1 at the end after time t it is currently worth s1 times exponential minus rt 
So the total is equal to S1 times N pads. So it's divided it's divided by since we're gonna end up with n path we're, we're gonna end up with s1 n path at different times so in each of the different simulations we get an s1 but since we simulated n path times we'll end up with n path different s1s so on average it's going to be s1 the sum of all the s1s we get divided by n path and again i have 1 over n path is equal to 1 divided by n path so that I don't have to do the division again and again. It's a small, it's a habit of not doing excess work. Again, there's a little bit more structure here. I'm multiplying it by a half. There's S1 and S2. That's due to the variance reduction technique that I'm using here which again as i said we'll we'll look at that in the next video so once we've simulated it all these times and discounted it and all that kind of stuff that is equal to the value of the call option using monte carlo and we can see that it's pretty much equal to the value that we got analytically so, so I'll just go back there. So I got 4.9 while the correct answer analytically, and again, this, this value is also given in the book. So the correct answer is 4.759. I got 4.9, but this was doing one simulation. If I do it again, I'll get a different value. If I do many, many simulations, so instead of doing, you know, here I'm doing 500 simulations, and this time I got actually a very close answer, but again, that's just luck. As we saw, the last time I got 4.9. That is the thing with Monte Carlo. There is a noise element there you'll roughly get it pretty quickly you know we're getting 4.7 ish 4 point something it's 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 kind of accurate but then you have to do a lot more work to get it more and more accurate so if i wanted it to be you know accurate to like 10 percent so it's within like 0 0.01 or well that's that, that would be one percent but you know if you want higher accuracy you need to do more and more work the convergence rate is one over the square root of n so to get it 10 times more accurate i need to do a hundred times more work that's why we look at variance reduction techniques in the next video where we're able to get greater accuracy